tonight, we're really delighted to welcome Deborah Rohde, author of What Women Want. When this book first crossed our desk several months ago, it really grabbed our attention. And it, and, um, it has a great title, timely subject. We were intrigued and reached out to her to ask her if she would come and share her work at Kepler's. And we're so pleased that she said yes, as she's written a really important book on a very important subject. Personally, having come of age post Title IX, I have to say I'm both astonished and dismayed at the lack of progress for women in America. By every possible measure, women continue to lag behind their male counterparts. In What Women Want, Rhody delves into every significant topic that affects the lives of women. Please welcome the Ernest W. McFarland Professor of Law and Director of the Stanford Center on the Legal Profession and the former Director of Stanford Institute for Research on Women and Gender, Deborah Rhody. I'm enormously pleased to be here and even more pleased that you're here. Woody Allen said that 90% of life was showing up. And of course, it matters what you show up for. And I'm so um, glad. No, I'm sorry. Do you need me to start over? No? Good enough? So let me begin, as does the book, with a New Yorker cartoon in which a woman frostily informs her obviously skeptical husband, yes, Harold, I do speak for all women. This is not a claim that any contemporary feminists will readily make. Women don't speak with one voice on women's issues. But to build a powerful political movement, we have to be prepared to generalize about the interests of women as a group. What would most women want if they were fully informed and free to choose? And the goal was equality between the sexes. What Women Want seeks to jumpstart a conversation about that agenda by surveying leaders of women's organizations and bringing together a broad array of research about what holds women back. The book begins with a brief autobiographical account of how I came to write the book. And I won't dwell on that now, although I'm happy to answer questions. I'll just say a few words about what it was like to be a woman law student and a faculty member in the not so good old days. I never at law school had a course taught by or about women. There were no women's organizations, and gender was notable for its absence in the curriculum. Things could have been, however, worse. At other law schools, including Harvard, there were ladies' days in which professors didn't call on women except for those particular days when the subject matter was specially adapted for their benefit rape cases with embarrassing facts, or hypothetical problems involving knitting and cooking. What's striking to me now is how little of this was striking to me then. It was just how law and life were. Sex discrimination was everywhere except in the curricula. I entered law teaching at Stanford when it was 1979, and I was for many years only one of two women on a faculty of 36 men. Initially, I indicated that gender and law was a subject I'd like to teach, and the dean would, was horrified. It would, as he put it, type me as a woman. Well, I responded with what I hoped was faint irony. It probably wouldn't come as a shock to most of my colleagues. And what, after all, were my alternatives? But of course, I'd missed his point. The point was academic credibility, and to establish that, I needed a real subject. He suggested negotiable instruments. We compromised on contracts, a field where I languished for seven years until the law school got a new dean, and I got tenure. It was a lonely life. Although my colleagues were well-meaning and unfailingly polite, they were essentially clueless about what it was like to feel the pressure and isolation of being one of two women on the faculty. Some couldn't even manage to keep the two of our names straight. Even though there was no physical resemblance between us, I was short and blonde, the other female was tall and brunette, and I was never sure whether to correct the colleagues who occasionally called me Barbara. These experiences might not have been so hurtful if I'd known at a time that they were typical byproducts of tokenism. Even the most prominent women can experience the problem. 
before the Supreme Court in the late 1990s, many lawyers mixed up the names of Justice Sandra Day O'Connor and Ruth Bader Ginsburg. In fact, so often that the Women's Judges Association once presented them with t-shirts reading, I'm Ruth, not Sandra, and I'm Sandra, not Ruth. My most vivid memory from those early years was the Dean's retirement dinner. The alumni threw a party at the local country club and hired a stripper to come and simulate her routine. None of the women present, including myself, could quite believe it was happening. But the dean appreciated the thought behind the invitation, and well fortified by bourbon, he embraced the invited guest. It was at that moment that I decided to hell with contracts. The law school needed a course on gender. Now, some three decades later, the legal landscape has been transformed. Women are moving up, barriers are coming down, about half of law students and 30% of full professors are female, and examples of blatant discrimination are rare. I teach a course on gender that raises no administrative eyebrows. Yet at the same time, this progress has created its own difficulties. And a central problem in securing gender equality is what I call the no problem problem, the lack of consensus that there is a serious problem or one that any individual women have capacity or responsibility to address. Yet on virtually every measure of social status, financial well-being, and physical safety, women still fare worse than men. Sexual violence remains common, and reproductive rights are by no means secure. Women assume disproportionate burdens in the home and pay a price in the world outside it. But these issues are not cultural priorities. What accounts for that fact? Well, part of the problem is the image of the feminist movement as strident and man-hating, which keeps many women from identifying as feminists or actively supporting the feminist agenda. Although when dictionary definitions of feminist are given, as someone who supports political, economic, and social equality for women, between two-thirds to four-fifths of women consider themselves feminists. But when you give no definition, the figure drops to a quarter to a half. Researchers find that identification of a as a feminist is insignificant because it correlates with activism. And the disconnect between the substance and the image of feminism has been a long-standing barrier to mobilizing Americans around gender issues. These negative associations are partly a function of how the media framed early activism. Press caricatures often perpetuated the image of the problem they claimed only to describe. If, as Time Magazine once claimed, hairy legs haunt the feminist movement, as do images of being strident. One reason for that image is that the mainstream publications continually featured those descriptions. Another reason for the no problem problem and the lack of identification as feminist is that many women don't feel worse off than men, so they lack the urgency that would fuel political activism or financial contributions to women's organizations. Does this mean the movement is stalled? It's one of the main questions I asked leaders of women's organizations, and I got a mixed response. Some felt we were totally stuck and getting pushed back, said Terry O'Neill, who was president of NOW. They pointed to the absence of women in leadership positions, the lack of progress on the pay gap, fights on reproductive issues, and the lack of an organized response. The president for the Center of Reproductive Rights noted that compared to what we had in the 1970s, we seem to be, as she put it, hibernating. By contrast, others took the long view. Women's issues were at least front and center in political campaigns, and the fact that we're here talking about this book is some measure of change. But the fact that we need to be here is a measure of the distance yet to travel. So what are the issues that should motivate women to seek change? Let me throw open, um, before throw opening the questions to you, a few areas where I think we're ripe for progress. Certainly employment comes first to mind. The labor force remains gender segregated and gender stratified, with women still overrepresented at the bottom and